I guess we can get started here. And thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And we're honored to have two eminent speakers, writers, uh, thinkers, and uh, we. Uh, Andrew Sullivan is uh, joining us by video link up uh, uh, because of some uh, he's recovering from uh, some health issues and so but we thank you uh, Dr. Sullivan for joining us tonight here through the link and thank you it's um, just to be clear I just want to apologize um, I have a sign I had sinus surgery and I'm having a serious uh, infection complication so I, they told me I can't really move so I'm doing this from here. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very sorry not to be there. I really wanted to. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us with all that you uh, have, to, have to deal with. Um, so I'll do a brief introduction of both of our speakers, and then I'm going to get out of the way, and we'll symbolically have an empty chair here, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew will be on the screen. and. Uh, Maybe I'll, I'll start with intro, introducing our uh, video uh, visitor here. Uh, Andrew Sullivan is a British-born American author, editor, and blogger, uh, political commentator, former editor of the New Republic, and the author or editor of six books. Uh, he started a political blog, The Daily Dish, in 2000, and uh, has written for many other uh, platforms, including Time, The Atlantic, The Daily Beast, and... Um, and elsewhere as well. Um, his uh, blogging was uh, considered extremely influential in uh, the movement uh, to legalize same-sex marriage and to advocate for gay rights in the United States. And uh, he's, uh, 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 his writing continues to be very uh, influential and well-read, so we're honored to have you here today. Uh, our um, other uh, Speaker tonight will, is uh, Rod Dreyer, um, senior editor and blogger at the American Conservative and author of several books, including The Benedict Option, um, most recently. Um, he was a film critic at the New York Post and has uh, had other uh, work in journalism, uh, commentaries on various platforms, including National Public Radios, All Things Considered, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. Um, and uh, uh, the Benedict Option has been described as, quote, the most discussed and most important religious book of the decade. So we're honored to have both of you here, and, and maybe we can all welcome them, and we're just going to start a conversation between the two of you. Thank you, Steve. Well, Andrew, how should we start? Um, I think that... Maybe one thing that's on my mind, uh, thinking about our, our meeting here, and people should know that we've been friends for a while, for many years. We've argued viciously. We've made up. And, uh, but people should know that I adore this man. I think he's one of the most important writers we have. And frankly, as a, as a social conservative and as a Christian conservative, I'm glad that on religious liberty issues and free speech, Andrew is on my side and I'm on his side. But I, I think that one thing that comes to mind when thinking about this, Andrew, is a conversation you and I had back in Boston the last time we saw each other a few years back, where you said that you were having trouble going to some college campuses. You weren't welcome uh, because of the gay left. And I said, How, what do you mean you're not welcome? You're Andrew Sullivan. You're one of the top people who made gay marriage happen. How is that possible? And you said, that's what's happening. Could you talk a little bit about that? Have things improved for you or... No, things keep getting worse. Um, I, I think that many people from the outside don't see exactly and haven't seen the dynamics within the gay and lesbian world. Uh, and therefore, when they look back at something like support for marriage equality, which I began in the late 80s and early 90s, they sort of think, well, that was obviously avant-garde. So obviously they would support that. The truth is that the gay rights movement has always been split within at least two factions. And uh, there's a more mainstream sort of traditional civil rights history and tradition. Uh, and there is a more radical post-Stonewall new left gay position. And marriage <clears throat> was really in neither, neither camp's purview, although there had been previous arguments in the 70s uh, on the right of the gay rights movement. There is such a thing. Uh, Anyway, 
when we brought up marriage, a few of us, and they were all of us who were right of center, except for Evan Wilson, a rather brilliant legal scholar uh, who forged, forged many of the legal arguments. And we met extreme opposition from the gay world. That we were not as gay as supposed to be getting married. We were supposed to be sub subverting marriage altogether, uh, not seeking a place at the table, but seeking to turn the table over. We were revolutionaries. We believed that we, the gayness was socially constructed as opposed to something that seems to be in the heart of many gay men and women and the brains. Uh, and so there was always this fight. And when we launched the marriage thing, it was regarded as a fight against the left. And I was targeted by the left for almost all of the 90s. And on this matter, the human rights campaign, the leading organization refused to fund it. The Clintons were obviously dead set against it in the 90s. And then things switched around when George W. Bush backed the federal marriage amendment. And then suddenly it became okay to be for gay marriage because you were against George W. Bush. But also what happened was that I think those of us who argued for marriage in the early days really did tap into a very widespread and underrepresented demand and desire of ordinary gay men and women to just get on with their lives and to, to be committed to another person, to settle down, and to, and to join society as equal members. This is very threatening and still is very threatening to people on the gay left, which is why Pete Buttigieg, for example, has been eviscerated in the gay media and certainly by the gay left, as you might have noticed in a recent piece by Masha Gessen, I think you, you, you referred to it. So that's where it comes from. I'm, I, yes, I'm a homosexual, but I'm regarded as a, almost a pariah in gay circles because of my defense of religious liberty, because of my belief in, in limited government and in individual rights and my opposition to things like affirmative action or social justice, critical race, gender theory. Um, so, yes, I'm a homosexual, but like Pete Buttigieg, I'm not gay enough for a large number of, of, of people within our community, and that's fine. Um, the truth is that we made our argument, we won the argument by and large. I think, I'm sure that you still have serious reservations about it, but in terms of public opinion, we definitely shifted things in the right, in what I consider to be the right direction. So, no, I, I, I shrug it off, really. but. It's where it is, and that's where the gay political movement currently is. It's where what they now call the LGBTQ plus movement. Um, I don't think there are any more consonants arriving anytime soon, but they're, they're probably in line. Um, so that's how it happens. You can be and have been for marriage equality, for simple civil equality, for integration, and still be uh, really apostatized by most of the gay community, never, never given awards, never asked to speak basically completely uh, deplatformed among gays. But, you know, I'm not whining. I, mean, I sound like I did, but I'm not whining. Well, so that's you, my answer. You know, uh, as, you, as you mentioned a second ago, uh, the argument that you and I had for, from about the year 2000 to, to the time of Obergefell was settled dramatically. Your side won. Where does that leave us going forward? Because my, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you, know, you and I both talked about how there's no point in rehashing that argument. It has been settled as a matter of public policy and, for that matter, as a, in the court of public opinion. Now comes trying to figure out how far gay rights can go without uh, running up against uh, religious liberty, freedom of association, and free speech. Uh, I think that's where the fight is now. Am, am I wrong about that? No, I think you're broadly right about that. Um, I think the question that overhangs everything is a question of employment non-discrimination, which is still possible to fire people because they're gay in over 20 states. I understand that is a, a pretty mainstream position. I don't think most Christians would even oppose uh, preventing real active discrimination against people solely because they're gay, I, outside of certain religious contexts. Um, my feeling, Rod, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic with, what, with where you're coming from, is that uh, the gay rights movement has shifted a little bit, uh, actually considerably, along with many other groups on the broad left in the last few years, um, to, to being more absolutist. In other words, to say, as, um, as is currently, I think, the prevailing wisdom in the Equality Act, which is the 
big legislation that they want to pass and has been endorsed by all the Democratic candidates, they really want to remove a zone of religious liberty, even for individuals who, for some reason or other, uh, don't want to, for example, uh, be a party to an operation that changes someone's sex, or that for some reason, uh, in their religious view, do not want to engage or interact commercially or in any other way with a gay couple, married couple, which requires them to acknowledge and endorse the actual marriage itself. Um, <clears throat> and obviously we have two things to balance here. We, we do have the rights of individual gay men and women to equal treatment under the laws, and I think we agree with, but I think we also have a right for religious individuals and small companies to, to live their lives as they wish to live. And I'm not upset uh, that you might turn up at a, a small florist or a small cake shop and find that the individual there for religious views doesn't want to serve you. I can see why that's upsetting, but I can also see why in a free society, uh, being upset is part of the to and fro of, of life. And as long as you can find an alternative, I don't mind that person expressing his or her religious views that way, even though I certainly wouldn't support that kind of religious view. Um, I think Jesus was about interacting with the most marginalized and the most stigmatized in society. And I don't think Christians should be policing themselves away from parts of the society that they might find uh, obnoxious or, or, or awkward making or, or immoral. Well, I, I think that, uh... One thing that I, I noticed today is so many Americans, especially younger ones, don't have uh, what I think is a proper understanding of what it means to be religious. People tend to think, I'm speaking broadly here, but in the time of moralistic therapeutic deism, to use Christian Smith's phrase, people tend to think of religion as, in terms of spirituality, as, as making a statement about oneself and one's own views towards God and towards the universe. But people who are truly religious whatever their religion is, they believe that they are, are, they are acknowledging a transcendent reality. It's not just an opinion, but it, it is an objective reality, one that may not be demonstrable to, to people outside the religion, but it's very real. And um, I, I think that as America secularizes, as it de-Christianizes, that we have lost or, and are fast losing that idea of what it means to be a religious person. And to be sincerely religious, even when it goes against the, the majority view. Uh, do you think, well, as why, a Christian yourself, that that's... Why, what, prevents, what prevents you from behaving as you wish and saying what you think in the current secular society? I mean, what are the actual constraints? I know the atmosphere has been shifting against uh, more fundamentalist strains in religion since, since the Enlightenment and certainly since the 19th century. Um, why is it so difficult now, apart from that, to act, actively live your Christian faith? Because the, uh, chiefly, I think it's the left. Uh, you, you saw the Connor Friedersdorf piece in The Atlantic talking about, uh, no doubt, pr talking about how at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, some professors who did a study on campus have been able to demonstrate that conservative students there self-censor because they're afraid of the reaction that they'll get from their professors. They're afraid of being attacked as bigots, uh, as fascist as this or that. And this is a real thing. And I, I, a friend of mine who, who yes, worked, but, go ahead. And I heard the same thing too know, from students know. here about this campus in Bucknell, that some of them are afraid to say what they really think, even if it's not terribly, something that's not terribly controversial in America outside of campus. And I think that it's an appalling thing if people can't, uh, can't say what they think, you know, within reason. We're not talking about being offensive and, and, and viol threatening violence, but I'm talking about something as simple as being a religious conservative or a political conservative. Yes, I, I can see that things are, there is an atmosphere that's being stoked on many campuses, which have the effects that you say. And I am very sympathetic uh, to the atmosphere that they're creating. But atmosphere does not dictate 
how you live or how you behave. Um, and, you know, I, I went to secular liberal universities as a, as a much more strict Catholic than I am today. And I didn't, I, I didn't mind being uh, opposed, talked, talked down to, or in many ways being uh, pushed back against. Uh, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to welcome mockery, abuse, uh, hostility. In fact, we're often, we're told and we believe that sometimes we're being most Christian when those things most happen to us because Christianity is a quite radical set of beliefs and it will and should make people want to mock it uh, or be feared of it, be frightful of it or be suspicious of it. And so I don't, I don't think you can just cite atmosphere because the truth is the atmosphere for Christianity has been shifting now for two or three centuries, right? I mean, where do you put this shift of secularism in the context of, you know, ever since the 17th, 18th century? I mean, some of us in the Catholic Church, I mean, historically, we got the Reformation as the beginning of the end. Um, but I see it as a continuous process, and I don't see a massive change in the last, in this century, for example, in terms of the ability of people to express their faith and to actually understand and believe that faith in a context of modern knowledge, science, interaction, et cetera. Yeah. I, um, aside, Why am I wrong? Go ahead. That's it. Why am I wrong? I'm just... No, I, I hear all the time from people, mostly on campus, but also within some corporations, especially in Silicon Valley, not just about religion, but about conservative politics or culturally conservative positions that they are afraid that people will learn what they believe because they've seen what stigma can do to their career prospects, can do to their, their stability there in the office. And this is something I'm told by older workers that just wasn't there before. But uh, now suddenly it seems the stakes are much higher. And, um, and I'm not quite sure why they're that- much higher on a, I would say they're much higher on a whole range of subjects. Uh, not just religion. I mean, I think that's a slightly separate situation in which uh, social constructionists from the critical theory tradition have decided that anyone who isn't actively in favor of everything they believe is therefore a racist, homophobe, sexist, transphobe, you name it. Um, and as, as seeking to intimidate people out of the public square who in any way violate those norms. That's a, but that applies on the question of sex. It applies on the question of race. It applies on the question of gender. Um, it even applies to understanding history and the reworking of history and the construction of new narratives about history. Um, but for an individual Christian, I do want to hear talk about, because I don't think you think of religion as without spirituality, right? So right. it's not that it is, it's integral to religious faith. And I think as Christians, when we, when we see people who, who are saying, I'm spiritual but not religious, which is, of course, the classic, uh, what you would call moralistic therapeutic deism, and I wouldn't be quite as harsh as you are about it, but um, that's where you start, isn't it? People sensing that there is something missing in their lives, something missing in the meaning of the universe as they understand it, uh, something they, 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 they need to stabilize themselves in times of of great difficulty and to calm themselves and, and restrain themselves in times of great triumph and happiness. Um, that is what religion does. And insofar as young people are seeking spirituality, I think that's a good thing. And I think it can lead to a greater exploration of things like tradition, liturgy, theology more grandly understood. But it starts with this quest for something that we understand modern society is not providing us. And that's a great place to start. That's where Pope Francis starts. That's where we're probably going to disagree after this point. But that's where I think Christianity has to go in the 21st century, simply because we can't undo modernity. And it's, it's undoable. You can't re-enchant a disenchanted world yeah. by yourself. Yeah, that's, that's And you think we can that's precisely it. The, the disenchantment of the world has such enormous consequences that I think many of us have yet 
to, to quite comprehend. Just earlier today when I arrived on campus, I was talking to a young man uh, who's here tonight who talked about how he was an atheist until about a year ago. And then he began to contemplate the radical evil in the world and began to think there must be uh, a force for good out there. There has to be. And I, when he mentioned this to me, he's not a Christian or he's exploring different faiths, but I told him when he, when he mentioned that story to me, I, I told him that he reminded me of uh, Auden, the poet W.H. Auden, who was, uh, had fallen away from the faith uh, as a young man. He was raised in England. He was living in New York in 1939, uh, not in the fall of 39, right after the Nazis invaded Poland. And he went to a movie, uh, to a, see a movie on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in a German neighborhood. Before the movie, there was a newsreel uh, showing news of the German soldiers invading Poland. Members of the audience stood up and started screaming in German, kill them, kill them. Auden was so shaken up by this, he, he came out and, and, and realized that there ha- the only force strong enough to stand against that sort of really barbarous racism and, and desire to murder was religious faith, was Christianity, and he returned to the faith. Um, I am wondering, Andrew, if that's the sort of thing that we might live to see in this century is that when people are confronted by radical evil or by immense suffering, that they will start to wonder if, the, if our ancestors were onto something. And I'll, I'll say one more quick thing. I heard, and this was on my blog yesterday, I have a doctor friend out, in, out west who's married to a Chinese woman who's not religious. Uh, Her family back in China are really suffering from the coronavirus thing. And he said that uh, she's become distressed in ways that he's never seen before over the whole course of their marriage. She's begun to say Buddhist prayers again. Her grandmother, under Mao, her grandmother still taught the basics of Buddhism to her and and her, her siblings. And now in this time of immense crisis, sustained crisis, she's returned to those prayers and those rituals. I find that fascinating, and my, my, my friend, the doctor, he's a Christian, he said something is going on in China with the Chinese people now. Doesn't mean that they'll go to Christianity or back to Buddhism necessarily or Taoism, but they are suddenly faced with a crisis that the materialism of the communist state cannot explain or help them through. I'm sure that's the case. Uh, it, begs a, it begs one big question. Um, well, let me just actually offer a counterexample to that, which is that you can go into Nevada, into the Black Rock Desert in late August, early September for the extraordinary Burning Man Festival. Now, you could not get a more contemporary, modern, postmodern crowd. There are a lot of tech gurus from San Francisco, young bourgeois bohemians, um, you name it. But it's, it's not hippies as such, because it's, it's much more responsible, has more self-responsibility. But... There, is a, there are a few rules, and one of them is that you can have no money. And the other thing is we are always generous to one another. The third is uh, you have to bring everything with you and take everything out. Also, there is a, a, a space in this enormous temporary city for a temple. Now, although these kids will be dancing all night long and doing drugs half the time, they feel the need somehow to construct a temple, a temple, a non-denominational temple, which you may, you may think of this as MTD and, and be horrified. But all I can say is that being there and praying for people I wanted to pray for and observing the silence and seriousness of the people there and the way in which just a spiritual space quietens people and focuses them. And I think many of the people there are explaining to us really that there is no modernity that doesn't need religion. It just makes it much harder to actually achieve. Um, but let's, I was going to ask you to talk about some of those other challenges, which is why people don't go from the I'm spiritual to the I am Christian. And I think, let me offer a few thoughts about that. Um, one is simply the notion that Christianity is a, a statement of historical fact or is, is, is simply an empirical assertion about the world. <clears throat> and because it describes acts 
and individuals who seem supernatural, that Jesus is heal healing people, for example, spontaneously, in which no one we've ever known has ever done, really. Uh, and because science has weighed in with all the authority it has, and my goodness, does it have that? And history has researched texts and scripts for religious faith. And we've learned some things. You know, we have learned some things about science since 2,000 years ago. And those things are true. And unless they are incorporated or understood within the truth of religion, religion will always have a hard time asserting that it's true. Not just that it's a nice way of living or that it's a spiritual vocation, but that it's true. And so I, I do think we have to face those things square in the face. Are we really going to Matt over, for example, uh, the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Or are we going uh, to really fight to death about the idea the Bible is a single text without error, as opposed to what we know to be the case, which is a function of multiple texts, often mistranslated and written down many, many, not many, many, but about three decades after Jesus was murdered. Um, so you tell me, how do you reconcile science and then history in modernity with Christianity? That was a big question, I know. But I feel like well, if we're going to uh, talk about it, we need to talk about it at its depth as opposed to just on its surface. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that truth is one, ultimately. And I believe that truth is transcendent and objective, but we can only know it imperfectly as, as mortals living in time. Uh, I believe as an Orthodox Christian that the Orthodox Church has the truest account of, of Jesus Christ and what his teachings meant and how we're supposed to live. On the other hand, I also know, and this is kind of interesting, maybe an interesting thing for us to talk about. For me, in the, the decade of the 2000s, the first decade, I had two incredible shocks. Uh, one, the sex abuse scandal uh, of the Catholic Church, which caused me to lose my Catholic faith. And two, losing faith in the Republican Party, though remaining a conservative over the Iraq War. Now, I, you know, you've known me a while. I used to be a very fervent Catholic, very ideological, politically engaged Catholic. And I was also a big, as you were, a big proponent of the Iraq War. I was in New York on 9-11. For me, I could not imagine there was any good reason to oppose the Iraq War. Um, and I was wrong about that. And my... I think that I, I, by the time I got to 2007, 2008, I lost, I had left the Catholic Church. I was no longer a Republican. And I had to confront the fact, the, the limits of my own ability to know things. I became an Orthodox Christian, not uh, in any sort of totally subjective sense. I do believe it's true. But at the same time, I became a very different sort of Christian, and I hope a different sort of conservative, not one who was so ready to throw down over every single thing because I had my intellectual pride, I had my nose rubbed in it. And I, think, I thank God for that. It was a severe mercy for God to, to let me get broken like that to, and to have to rebuild a faith and a politics out of the ruin that I had made of my own, the own castle I had built. To go back to your question, though, about science, I, I believe that we, you're right, it, we have to uh, incorporate the findings of science into and find some way to reconcile it within our religious faith. But as an Orthodox Christian, I'm comfortable with mystery to say that we don't know it yet. We may know it sometime in the future, but we don't know it yet. What I strongly oppose, though, is scientism, the idea that if it can't be scientifically proved, then it must not be true. Uh, I don't see that there's any way to reconcile that with any kind of faith that, that, that posits a transcendent God or a transcendent order of being. But science and scientism are not the same thing in the same way that religion and fundamentalism are not the same thing. Yeah, well, you know, we went through a very similar trajectory. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. I, too, uh, was gutted by the sex abuse crisis in many different ways. I mean, I, my own parish was... Uh, a center of it. We were, I was in the parish of McCarrick and then Wuerl. Um, 
and I know people who've been affected by it, and it 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 is such an unthinkable, immoral abuse that that it could be perpetrated by and covered up by people at the very top of the hierarchy and lied about. It was very hard, very hard to recover. Similarly, I think for many evangelical Christians, I think the total uh, co-optation of evangelical Christianity by Trumpism, by, by the cult of, of this figure, has also been terribly uh, destructive to the credibility of evangelical leaders in talking to the next generation of people seeking faith. So all of the existing institutions, including the American government, which was discovered to be inflicting torture on people, I lost all these authorities at the same time as you did, uh, or similarly. Uh, but I'm, and I agree with you about mystery. I do think that is the right answer to say when you're pushed very far by science. But at the same time, uh, I do think it behooves us to sort of realize that, for example, that heaven is not up there, <laughs> that there is something that science has given us. So the evolution, for example, natural selection is the core element of human nature, not Aristotle, not Aquinas. You can't hold Aquinas and Darwin in your head at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. A Christian has to choose between those two and to understand the truth about the world. Um, so that's what I mean by a sort of compromise. You can say ultimately it's mystery, and I think it is. Uh, we cannot understand these things because they're by their nature beyond our understanding. But that within that broken field of doubt and faith, and faith and doubt, uh, you can winnow out some obviously false uh, flags. We can obviously ignore some aspects of uh, of the Gospels and, and focus on the things that are, we know are more substantive and important in them. Um, and so I think there's a way to grasp mystery without denying that science does exercise, not scientism, but science does exercise a disciplinary uh, interrogation of religion, which we should take seriously. And secondly, we, we should not address, which is the source of the text. Now, you're an orthodox person, so you're not, you're not wedded to literalism in Scripture, I, I know that, I don't, but it seems to me the one thing the Orthodox Church has gotten right is ritual and the ineffable expression of liturgy and ritual, which yeah. is the sort of other space to <clears throat> modern life. And I think Christianity would be more successful if it both talked about, yes, spirituality is wonderful and important, is the, is the root, that human quest is the root of all the faith, um, but also that, uh, that there is a tradition here, that for millennia now, human beings have tried to live according to this man's uh, way of life, and they have things to tell us, their traditions to impart, that we are foolish to throw away, that we should treat with profound respect, and that we have thrown away, I think, to our great detriment. Um, I'm talking particularly about what happened in the Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council right. with respect to liturgy and ritual. And it basically destroyed it. Uh, uh, and so I would favor that. You know, I do favor mystery and I do favor ritual and tradition as an alternative to empirical fact. At the same time, I do not want to deny the extraordinary insights into the world that science has brought us, that the Enlightenment brought us, that Darwin brought us, uh, that genomics and genetics are now informing us more about, about what is true about the world. And when you read the Gospels, he's not talking about that anyway. I mean, he's just not. It's, it's not an interest of his. Uh, Jesus, I think, in the great irony, is not really promoting a religion. He's, well, he's being who he was. Uh, and that affected people in a profound way in order for them to then construct a religion in his memory. So I think getting back to Jesus' own life is always a good thing. And I think our own theology and ideology can get in the way of that. Well, I, uh, you make me think about what brought me to Christianity in the first place. I was mm -hmm. 17 years old. I thought I knew everything. This must not, may not have happened to you, but when I was 17, I knew everything. And I thought the only choices for Christianity, or the, I thought what Christianity was, was either bourgeois conformity 
um, or it was Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, for those of you who are younger, Jimmy Swaggart was a TV evangelist who was very big in the 1980s. And I went to school in Baton Rouge uh, at LSU, so he was a local guy. I, I knew that I didn't want bourgeois conformity and I didn't want you know, Jimmy Swaggart's sort of Pentecostal fundagelicalism, whatever he is. And I thought that was it. Fundagelicalism? Well, yeah, but my, my mom, that, when I was in high school, my mom won a trip to Europe in a church raffle and didn't want to go. She sent me. I was the only young person on a bus, a coach full of elderly Americans motoring through Europe. I just wanted to get to Paris and go to the museums, go to see the Hemingway places. The bus stopped on the way to Paris, about an hour outside the city, to go look at an old church. And I thought, oh, God, here we go. I went in anyway, just because I didn't want to sit on the bus for an hour. And this was the Chart Cathedral. Andrew, there's nothing in my life growing up in small town America in the late 20th century that prepared me for the glory of God in the stones, in the glass, in the lines of that glorious medieval cathedral. I didn't walk out of there as a Christian, but I walked out of there on a search. I knew somehow beyond my rational faculties that God existed and he wanted me. Um, I've come back to that over the years. You know, I, didn't, I, I ended up, six years later, I converted to Catholicism. And by the way, folks in the room, I was received into the Catholic Church in St. Matthew's Cathedral, and the first person to congratulate me and to welcome me to the church was Andrew Sullivan. Um, and uh, I, Easter Vigil, 1993. But anyway, I, I, I realized... Wow, I, you know, I had forgotten that. I'm, it's true. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I remember when I was coming into the Catholic Church, I was still living in Louisiana then. I was at the newspaper, my first job. A woman... Uh, who worked at the paper, came to me and said, oh, I hear you're interested in Catholicism. I'm a Catholic. Why don't you come work with me at the Missionaries of Charity Soup Kitchen this weekend? And I thought, all of 23, I thought, that's wonderful. I'm, that sounds like a very Catholic thing to do. I'll be there. So I went there, spent the Saturday peeling potatoes, scrubbing pots, et cetera. When it was over, I said, well, you know, really, I'm more of an intellectual. My time would be better spent reading theology. Never went back to the soup kitchen. Fifteen years later, when my Catholic faith was in ruins, I had to reflect on the fact that my intellectualism as a Catholic uh, had left me a lot more fragile than I expected to be. Uh, if I'd gone back to the soup kitchen, and I, I'm using that literally and metaphorically, meaning if I had done the practices, not just the, the cogitation, not just rearranging the syllogisms, but done the practices, my faith probably would have been stronger. As an Orthodox Christian, uh, in Orthodoxy, we do place a, a premium on practices, on liturgy, as formative. We don't put down thinking, and re you can find some ve very deep Orthodox theology, but it is secondary to the conversion of the heart. And uh, I have uh, rec I've been thinking a lot over the past few years about something that Pope Benedict XVI said, that the best arguments for the church are the art it produces and the saints. And those open the door to truth. In other words, the embodied, the embodiment of the faith in the lives of holy people and in art and architecture, these are the things that go beneath our rationalism and open our minds up to the truth. I think this is something that you, you point to when you, talk, when you praise the Orthodox Church about its, its glorious liturgy. You're absolutely right. But it's not just something aesthetic. It is, it is something that points beyond itself to an encounter with the living God. Yes. I, I don't want to. I, it's, not, it's not art appreciation. Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm just clarifying for the uh, audience. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I have... Two responses to what you said, and one is that I too went to Chartres Cathedral at roughly the same age that I was taking on a Catholic tour of the great cathedrals of France as a schoolboy. And yes, it never, you enter that space, and I've entered other spaces, spiritual spaces of the great medieval and sometimes Victorian, the Brompton Oratory, Westminster Abbey, uh, Canterbury Cathedral, these other shrines. And I was overwhelmed by how much more beautiful and serene and profound, this felt than anything outside, anything in modernity at all. And I was like 
I was I was a cradle Catholic, so I've always been this. Um, and we always had the shitty church at the other end of the town because the uh, the the beautiful ancient churches in our towns were all taken over by the Protestants and the Reformation. So we had these red brick monstrosities that were then sort of uh, carpeted in beige for us in the 1970s. Um, so that feeling that these people in the past knew something, I don't. That's it. And that, their value, and the value system that would direct all their energies and resources and creativity and physical labor into constructing what is essentially a spaceship from God that lands. <laughs> I can't imagine what it would have been like as a peasant in rural France to be walking on a pilgrimage and suddenly see that peering over the horizon. And then to go into it and see the, the light change and the, the architecture so I mean, the whole thing was simply extraordinary. And it's a fact that we do not and cannot in our culture produce such a thing today. We don't. So we've lost something. That was isn't, a, that isn't was that the amazing? For all our wealth, all our scientific brilliance, we can't produce something as beautiful as what the, medieval, the high medievals did. I mean, I, I, because I we don't I, have meaning to apply to beauty, you know? We don't, right. we don't take it as seriously as they did because for them it really was a manifestation of God. And God was very real, a much realer than he is for most people today, which is, you know, connected to your points about suffering. I mean, human beings forever were, we were always at the edge of survival. We were always subject to pestilence, to injury, to illness, to all sorts of things that we have overcome essentially in vast amounts of the world. and that experience of plenty and want and comfort are not stimulating, stimulating for, the, for the spiritual mind right. and soul. Um, and I think poverty, which is why the church has emphasized it so often, is actually a part of spirituality, an extremely important part of Christi Christianity and spirituality. The second thing I learned as a kid was my grandmother. I was brought up um, in a very traditional Catholic family, but my grandmother was the most traditional of all. There were little holy waters in every room, like little, little dipping. So you, every, you went to the bathroom, you had to cross yourself in the Holy Spirit. Um, it, uh, and I remember going to mass with her as a young English kid, and she was from Ireland. She was the seventh of 13 children from, in Tralee in Western Ireland. And uh, alcoholic father, I mean, almost a stereotype, no real education after 16, if that worked as a cleaning lady for priests and deacons most of her life. And she had a broad Irish accent and a rather loud voice. And I remember feeling excruciated when she would rattle off the Our Father or the Rosary, sounding like someone announcing a, you know, a, a, a racehorse track meeting. And, but there was one moment when I watched her and looked at her as she was in the middle of the Rosary. And it was a simple moment. I looked aside and I just saw her, that she was in a place, a deeper, more peaceful, more serene place than I had ever been and that I might ever go. And in that very minute, I realized all my education or intelligence, uh, none of this ultimately matters for God. I can use it for God's worth, but I am just worthy in myself and that and that in trying to reach God, I will, that's the only way I will find calm and peace. And my grandmother, with no education, no learning, no wealth, was so much more serene and peaceful and calm and godly than I could ever imagine. So I always looked up to her, always did. And she's often in my dreams. Uh, and her spirituality was incredibly simple, really desperately simple. And that's what I, that's what I think a lot of us long for the simplicity of that kind of faith. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's beautifully said. And you, you've just articulated art and the saints, or rather, you know, a human being incarnating the faith in a simple but direct and pure way, as well as art. And those open the doors to God for you. And I think that it's interesting that we're having this conversation here because you don't hear religion talk about this in this way in our media or in the public square. It's always down to politics or wh where do you stand on abortion or gay rights and you know, religious right, religious left, and so on and so forth. It's such a, an impoverished way 
of thinking about what it means to live as a, as a religious person. But it, it seems that we don't know, I say we, meaning in public life in America today, we don't know any other way to talk about it. I can remember when I was a columnist at the New York Post in the early 2000s, I was going to write a story about um, some evangelicals in the outer boroughs. I, I forget what it was, but my editor, city editor shot it down and said, you don't understand, New York is not a religious town. And I thought about, this guy lived in the same neighborhood as I did in Brooklyn. We both used the same subway stop. He had to walk past two Protestant churches, a Catholic church, a mosque, a storefront evangelical church, uh, and a synagogue to get to the subway. But he was completely blind to them. This aspect of life in New York was outside of his vision. To him, because he was a secular political guy, Religion only mattered in New York because, uh, from a political point of view. What is Cardinal O'Connor saying? What are the rabbis in Brooklyn saying? And uh, this entire dimension of, of life in that city and indeed beyond that city in our country is completely blind to those who, who set themselves up and, and who are the, the people who frame the way we think about, about our life, our public life. It's hard to... I, this, is a, this is a true story. Once Tina Brown called me up, this back in the, when she was writing The Heights of New Yorker fame, and she said, um, Andrew, darling, uh, we've, uh, we've got all these fabulous photos. Uh, the Avedon, Dickie Avedon, has done all these amazing spiritual leaders across the world. It's fabulous. So I would like you, I'd like you to write an essay accompanying all, all these photographs. I'm like, well, what would the essay be about? So I don't know, religion, you know, whatever's now, whatever's hot in religion. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I passed up the, the commission. But the idea that there's something hot now in religion that we haven't known for 2,000 years or longer, uh, so secular New York meeting something it neither understood, it didn't understand at all. Um, and... So that is, that is, we don't get that. And we don't get people, I mean, we're very reticent about our faith. I mean, I am too. I don't want to, I don't want to make people uncomfortable, you know? I, 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 but at the same time, I don't want to, because sometimes bringing up a religious question is inappropriate. You know, it's, it's not the right setting. And so we, you don't do it everywhere or you're in danger of becoming a fanatic. But when the subject goes that way, I don't. I think we should need to be clearer and more public about these spiritual and religious experiences that we know are true in a way that no intellectual abstraction will ever be true or persuasive to people. So, for example, you know, I I was never close to God. I think than during the two or three years of the worst of the AIDS epidemic. Again, because so much suffering was around you that you could not begin to contemplate the fairness of it, the young people in not just death, but really, really uh, crippling and dehumanizing disease uh, that rendered them scarcely human to look at. Um, and I remember uh, a particular mixture of events when my best friend was diagnosed with AIDS and my mother was actually independently admitted to a mental hospital and I was diagnosed. And it was my 30th birthday and uh, I was walking out on Cape Cod towards the beach and I dropped to my knees at one point. I didn't really decide to drop to my knees, but I did. And I was just overcome. And I don't think I can not believe in God because I think it's so deeply rooted in my mind and soul that I can't get rid of it. But for about 15 minutes on my knees in the dunes, no one around, I thought, well, maybe God is evil. Maybe that's the reality. Not that there is no God, but that God is actually a malign presence tormenting people who don't deserve it. Which, of course, is I'm not the first person to have that revelation or to have that suspicion of doubt. It's the ultimate question, isn't it? Uh, and I did not answer it in my mind. Uh, but after 15 minutes, I, I almost literally felt someone bring me up, like they were a human being lifting me up onto my feet again, hugging me and just saying, go forward, go forward. I took that as God's 
intervention in my life to tell me to continue and not to lose faith in his goodness. Uh, now, that's a very contemporary dramatic example, right? I mean, we were talking about gay man in the 21st century. Spirituality and God impacts anyone, anywhere, anytime, including the most modern, the most bohemian, the most cosmopolitan, whatever. Um, I do wish that exactly those people, cosmopolitans, the liberal elites, and so on, would at least show some respect for the religious uh, vocation and the religious calling. And increasingly, they regard it as a preposterous bullshit that they will not tolerate. This is sort of the new atheism and then also the new leftism. And most of the most intelligent liberal people I respect, even if they're atheists, do understand that this is a vital part of the human experience, that we should respect and treasure it. The smartest of them actually want to defend it, even though they don't believe in it, because they understand the role it plays. And also, taking it out of our lives, removing it, will not end the void in our lives. And we will fill that void with something else. Like politics. Uh, whether it be like politics, yeah, absolutely. You know, or will, uh, right or left, um, I see a lot of the, you know, the great awakening, as they call it, as a sort of desperate attempt somehow to have some spiritual meaning that translates into everyday life that somehow makes you part of making a better world. And I think at its best, that's what people, but it's obviously not like that in the end. But I see these, what I would call fake religions, or what Ross Douthat, our friend, would say, you know, bad religion. <laughs> coming into the space where real spirituality and uh, a respectful faith should exist. Well, you know, um, I, I've been, with this book I'm working on now, that'll be out in September, we're doing a lot of research on the life under communism. And studying the Bolshevik Revolution was, really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Uh, there's a historian, Yuri Sleskin, out of Berkeley, who wrote a, a well-reviewed book, came out a couple of years ago, called The House of Government. It's a history of the Bolshevik Revolution. And he talks about the Bolsheviks, the early communists, as being a millenarian apocalyptic cult without God. They placed um, history as their God, the working class, and, and so on. And I, I had never quite thought about it that way, but Sleskin is actually very meticulous in this and talking about the, uh, quoting the writings of the early Bolsheviks and then Lenin. Uh, these are religious scriptures. These are, it's a deeply religious way of seeing the world. It's unfalsifiable and it was radical. And so uh, it rushed in to fill that void that was there when czarism fell apart and people had, had really struggled to believe in the Orthodox Church and so on and so forth. Religion gave them, or this the pseudo-religion, this totalitarian religion, gave them a sense of meaning and it told them who was good and who was evil. You know, we can, the line between good and evil runs between classes and if we just kill the bad people, then we'll be living in paradise. As you well know, that was that the best known line from Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago is that having, his, having learned that the line between good and evil runs right down the middle of each human heart. I learned that, by the way, in the hard way in writing about the Catholic sex abuse scandal. Prior to 2002, I had this general idea, a very simplistic idea, but a, it was there that the line between good and evil ran between the conservative bishops and the liberal bishops, and I was on the side of the conservatives. I learned in writing about this that you couldn't tell who was, who was good and who was evil based on what their, their, their theological principles were. Some of the most heroic priests in that scandal were liberals, some of the greatest villains were conservatives, and vice versa. Um, so this was part of the humbling that I, that I took, is having to learn uh, to refuse that sort of Manichaean idea that feels very good to identify who the evil people are and so we can go get them. But uh, it's ultimately a lie, and it's a lie that will destroy us. Uh, as we were talking at dinner tonight, the, the Bolsheviks went after the Mensheviks. Similarly, in our culture today, I fear 
that uh, identity politics, people finding ultimate meaning in their sexual identity, their racial identity, and so forth, and finding and picking out who is good and who is evil based on identity, it's going to be the ruin of us. I, I hate to interrupt the conversation here, but we are... It's getting started. We are, I know, we're just getting started here. I, <laughs> we're uh, at 8 o'clock. Uh, we can hopefully consider, continue this a little bit, maybe with some questions, if that's okay. Um, and... Um, you know, whatever thoughts you all still want to throw in. So thank you for this great conversation. I'm just going to give a quick public service announcement that this uh, talk is brought to you all by the Questioning American Identity series of the Bucknell Program for American Leadership and Citizenship. Uh, BPALC, you can look up upcoming events, which are at bpalc.blogs.bucknell.edu. I think after spring break, we're going to have a few several events in March and early April. In this particular series, the next event will be Tuesday, March 24th, when Professor Victor Davis Hansen of the Hoover Institution at Stanford will speak on America's identity in the world, the Korean War, 70 years on. So that uh, talk will explore the 70th anniversary of the Korean War, uh, looking back at its legacy and forward to what what aspects of that legacy may continue with us into the future. So. Um, so with that uh, PSA out of the way here, sorry for the interruption, um, I think we'll start having people come down for questions, uh, if that's okay with the speakers, and uh, feel free to the speakers to continue your conversation I, on the questions, if that's okay. Can I make this one extra point oh, sure. to what Please Rod is talking about? Which is this word unfalsifiable, because that is in many ways a definition of religious truth. Uh, and most political traditions in the West have engaged with empirical reality. They've, they've talked about things that exist that they need to tackle and they're judged by their results in tackling those issues. The thing about critical race, critical sex, and critical gender theory is that it is unfalsifiable like a religion. In other words, that it, it posits itself as the ultimate answer to which everything else must be fit. Uh, and there's no reality outside of it to challenge it. So, the, for example, all thought is rooted in, they would argue, uh, all reality is rooted in thought, and all thought is rooted in identity. And therefore, the world is a constant struggle for power among those identities. And that means it's a constant struggle for power between groups representing those identities. And there is un this new Marxism, Marx was thoroughly falsifiable and, and was falsified. This stuff can't be because it doesn't start with any, it starts with a doctrine, not an, not an argument. Um, and once you think your very thought is merely a product of your identity, that what I'm thinking is entirely a product of the evolution of my skin and my body. And for some reason, because I was, grew up and came from stock that came from the North, west of Europe, somehow I'm thinking differently than somebody from Sub-Saharan Africa or someone from the American South or someone from Brazil. I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. I think that human experience is human, that what we have in common overwhelms what we, what just, what we, have, what we don't have in common. And that thought is thought. It, can, it, is, it is an instrumental and, and absolutely real variable here that you can rely on, that you can reason that we can see where an argument fails, that we can look at reality and assess its truth or not. And what I fear about this particular latest movement is that its fanaticism is related to that kind of um, unfalsifiable religious well, faith. Um, I, I, think yeah, this, right. I think the signal event, one of the signal events of this decade was what happened to Professor Nicholas Christakis of Yale University on the quad there at Yale. Uh, in October 2015, he went out to try to engage a group of students, of undergraduates, who were furious at his wife for having written a letter saying that the university, to, to the people in, in, her, in her undergraduate house, uh, saying that the university shouldn't be in the business of telling adults how to dress for Halloween. This caused this, I don't, some of you may have paid attention back then, but it caused this enormous blow up on campus. And there was her husband, Professor Christakis, on the quad trying to engage these students in reason, rational debate. He couldn't do it. 
they screamed at him. They sobbed. They were absolutely hysterical. They cursed him. And I thought, there is the end of our civilization right there. When, and he's a liberal, uh, you know, a good classical liberal. He's trying to respect them and engage them in discourse, rational discourse, and they weren't having it. They felt that their dignity had been assaulted simply by this letter his wife had sent, and they demanded that he grovel before them. It was like the, like the Chinese Cultural Revolution. That is a scary thing to me, and you'll remember, Yale University uh, completely acquiesced to their demands and threw the Christakis under the bus. That's the sort of thing that you're talking about, that uh, when, we, when we embrace identity to such an extent that rationality becomes impossible, then we're in very, very dangerous waters. We're in totalitarian waters. My point is that the underlying premise of the entire argument Philosophically, if you go back to the post-structuralists, if you go back to Foucault, Derrida, and, and, and the people from whose thought this stuff has been gleaned, uh, the important thing to know is that there is no such thing as God. There is no redemption. There isn't even a communist revolution at the end of all this. There was just a constant struggle against, against other races and other... Uh, uh, you realize that, that power is, by their own argument, the only thing that matters. And therefore, and power has to be seized, not persuaded. So it's all about, for them, coherently within their own ideology, about power, suppressing other people, forbidding other thoughts, uh, because that's where power, or I think more subtly, refashioning the English language itself so that words do not mean what they used to mean or what they still mean for most people. So they're actually engaging in the most fanatical power move, which is to actually ransack the English language, which is what Orwell, of course, is warning about. And it's all in Hannah Arendt, too. You know, it's in her origins of totalitarianism. And it's unbelievable to me that we're having to relive this right now. I mean, the 20th century was not that long ago, and yet we seem bound to determine not to learn from history. I was, when I was in, in the former Soviet bloc last fall doing reporting for this new book, um, I was shocked to find that even the post-communist generation of young people there don't really know and don't really care about what happened to their parents. The more time I spent there, the more I began to realize that for young people listening to their parents talk about sol the solidarity labor movement, the oppression of communism, was about like me in the 1970s as a kid listening to my father who grew up in rural poverty during the Great Depression talk about the lessons that I needed to learn, my sister and I needed to learn about saving money because you never know what's going to happen. It was like, yeah, 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 that's nice. But we were future-oriented. That's what it's like in, in the former uh, Soviet bloc countries today, and also in Russia, I found out. And uh, it scares some, a lot of these people I talked to who, who had resisted communism because they, they feel like this, abs this absence of historical memory, of cultural memory, of it being completely filled in with uh, consumerism coming and hedonism coming from the West, that it's going to end very badly for them. Who wants to get somebody to ask a question? Yeah. I'm a Presbyterian minister in, um, here in central Pennsylvania, and the real tragic thing about the dynamic you just described is my people in my church see that, and then when I try to bring up racism in the church, they go, oh, see, look at the nuts over here. There's, they're all crazy. There's nothing to it. So it undermines you know, my attempt to try to reach people with the gospel that cares about racial reconciliation because all they see is the craziness on college campuses. But anyway, my question is, um, do you have any hope that there can be a middle ground with regard to uh, same-sex marriage between someone like me who cannot do in good conscience because of my biblical beliefs a, a same-sex wedding and yet would, would happily, willingly vote for someone to have the rights to do, to do what I disagree with. You know, so if I meet you halfway and I say, you make space for me, I'll make space for you. Can, someone like Robbie George at Princeton might say, you're crazy. There's never going to be a grand bargain. You know what? 
do you think there can be some kind of a grand bargain or do you think, what do you see in the future? Do you have hope that we could agree, disagree agreeably, or do you think both sides are so, are, are there elements of both sides that are so intractably committed to the absolutization of their view that we're not going to, we're just going to splinter apart more and more. Do you think there's hope for a, a middle ground? Is there hope? Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm not very hopeful. I think that ideally we should be able to live in that sort of, it's a very liberal settlement. You know, and you suddenly see the brilliance of classical liberalism in facing just the sort of problem that, that you bring up. But um, Andrew wrote a really good column recently about this new book that's out by a writer named Christopher Caldwell, who talks about uh, the civil rights movement and the civil rights settlement, the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, uh, being such a paradigm for the way American politics has worked since the, the 1960s. Uh, the government came in to, to kill the devil of segregation. The government came in with a very, very big hammer and started smashing. Well, according to Caldwell, the problem is that if everything becomes civil rights, uh, whether it's uh, what, what women, uh, women's rights, gay rights, and so on, if everything is seen through the civil rights paradigm of the 1960s, then eventually things like free association, freedom uh, of religion, freedom of speech become pressed more and more and more uh, to the wall. And ultimately, this can't be reconciled in, in Caldwell's view. Andrew, I would like to hear what uh, you can talk about what you wrote in your column, but I have to agree with you that Caldwell is really persuasive about the irreconcilability of the two in the real world. And that makes me very depressed about American politics. Well, I would, first of all, the answer the pastor's question is, is I, absol I absolutely believe there is a, a way of, 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 of living and let live. Um, and I feel the same, I can't see you, but I feel the same way about you that you do about me, which is that as a gay man, I will stand up and defend any fundamentalist Christian's right to live and speak the way they want to. And I, I would hope that on those terms, at least in terms of speaking and being and bearing witness to oneself, you would be able to say the same thing. The difference is here, and I will go back to my book, Virtually Normal, and my original arguments, which were quite carefully crafted to avoid the trap that Christopher Caldwell uh, uh, suggests has happened. Uh, I desperately wanted to have a politics of homosexuality that was not tied up in that idea of the government coming in and stamping out discrimination, which meant for me that, that I'm rather indifferent to private employment, housing, public accommodation questions with regard to, to gays, and certainly affirmative action and all the other aspects of that civil rights regime. But I am in favor, and I take Arendt actually as, as one of the people who influenced me on this, that the state itself should not treat a gay person and a straight person differently because of their sexual orientation. It follows, therefore, that they should not be firing people from the military just because they're gay as opposed to whether they can do their job, which is not a violation of any constitutional norm. It's just a sort of adaptation of the current. And also, and this was a tougher argument, but the right to marry is not, uh, has not been enfolded into the civil rights movement. It is, it was in one instance in terms of the, the bans on interracial marriage, which I think are totally, but that's just to bring everybody up to the same standard neutrally, legally. And I think allowing adults uh, gay people to marry each other civilly um, with all the benefits and drawbacks that marriage entails is simply equal treatment under the law. It, it is not a sort of civil rights liberalism. It is a much more basic, this is no straight person has ever conceived of their lives without this right. Uh, you are not materially different in your ability to perform this particular institution than they are. And therefore, if gay people want it, they should have it, and we can make the argument for it. I think that's why it won, because we weren't saying we want you to change. We weren't saying we want you to affirm that there's no such thing as sex. We weren't saying we want you to affirm that there is no such thing as God. We, weren't, we were simply asking to be treated by the government the same as everybody else. And we did that, and we're done. as far as I'm concerned, I'm basically done. Uh, but there is a very, there's an important philosophical difference between arguing for equal treatment by the state 
and equal treatment by private individuals or free associated groups within the society as a whole. I think there's a very clear distinction. Um, and in some ways, to grapple with Caldwell's point about how this is very hard to contain, I would have contained it solely with African Americans and justified it on the basis of the unique disadvantage of slavery and segregation, which no other group in our society has ever been subject to in that kind of way. So that's where I would draw the line, but it's a rather pragmatic one. But philosophically, of course, I can have a civil marriage and I can meet you on the street as a fundamentalist pastor and have a, have a very nice conversation. And I can be part of a school board with you. I can, I can all sorts of things, as long as there's mutual respect. So I'm, there's, a, there's also a bill in front of Congress called the Fairness for All Bill, which is based upon what happened in Utah, what's called the Utah Compromise, in which the Mormon church said, okay, we are going to <clears throat> support marriage equality and broad raft of discrimination provisions for gay people, as long as you explicitly at the same time guarantee our right to police ourselves and our institutions the way we want to. And that compromise was reached in Utah of all places. And I think it's a model for the nation. And I think the Fairness for All Act, which is the federal bill, is a much better instrument to achieve that than what's called the Equality Act, which is a much more radical and dangerous attack on, I think, freedom of association and freedom of thought, uh, and I, indeed homosexuality itself. I want to push back a little bit on that, Andrew. I, I don't know enough about the Fairness for All Act to, to comment on it, but about the, the, the civil rights paradigm being applied and expanded out to, to cover other groups, I can remember being uh, uh, an editorial board member and a columnist at the Dallas Morning News in the first decade of the century, and we were debating gay marriage within the editorial board. And uh, it was impossible, I found, to get even get a hearing for the traditional point of view, simply because my, some of my colleagues would say, but would you deny this to a black person? I mean, they saw a one-to-one -one parallel between homosexuality and race. And I said, well, it's not the same thing exactly. All right, I lost that. We, we know that. But now it's glued on to transgender. And you have the same paradigm being used, the same, uh, uh, the, the, this, the, this is the sacred, uh, political, politically it's the most sacred thing that happened in American history in the 20th century, the civil rights movement. And now it's being brought in and appropriated to push trans rights. And e even though philosophically there's something really different between transgender folks and, and or transgender and race. But as a, at a practical level, it seems that it's impossible to have these conversations once the civil rights movement is invoked on the side of expanding rights. It, it, is that fair? As long as you can, I think it's not. For example, I'm a big supporter of transgender equality, which means that I believe that transgender people are not lying about who they are. And I do believe that they should be protected to some extent from wanton discrimination and hatred. I, th I don't think we'd be in a terrible disagreement. Maybe we would on the former. I don't know. But I, I know enough, and enough trans people to know they're, not, I, they're neither um, in any way uh, somehow delusional. And they are also, as, as adults, uh, as fully formed adults. Um, and most of them are much more sensible than their activist uh, defenders. Um, they don't deny the reality of binary or bimodal sex, because if they did, they wouldn't exist. I mean, they want to go from one sex to another. Deny all sex, and you, 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 you get rid of trans people altogether. So they're not really all down with this latest critical gender theory uh, claptraps, I would call it. Um, and I think most of us in our society have always wanted, I mean, decent people have never wanted to be cruel or hateful towards people who are obviously who they are. And I do think, again, there's a liberal solution here. Uh, it doesn't require abolishing the differences between men and women. It, can, it doesn't have to make the exception the rule. Um, it can insist that the exception actually does exist. We're a strangely varied human species, but it actually proves the rule in general. Um, I think that's a way to argue for minority rights. Um, I, I, I just don't, don't go ahead. I, I, I just don't think that realistically uh, a liberal solution is possible. I would favor some kind of liberal solution like what the pastor said uh, about uh, resolving how to live together in this pluralistic society. 
but it, it seems that the, the momentum on the left, uh, on the left elites, mind you, and I, I underscore elites, in academia, in media, in corporations, and so forth, it, that opinion is solid, it's strong, and they've got the wind at their back. I, I don't see why they should compromise, judging from, a, from a, just a strictly um, pragmatic point of view. Well, from a strictly pragmatic point of view, it's all about politics and power and all the rest of it. Um, but I do think that most people in the country are generally speaking in a small L sense liberal. And they do want to live and let live. They don't want to engage in persecution. They don't want to engage in hatred. I mean, there are a small minority who do, but, but most people don't. And I think if we live in a society where that's true, we should be possible to get past the activists on both sides to forge a sort of uh, modus operandi between us. Um, and I think we have to do that in forums like this, to be honest, Rod, because you and I are I mean, we're kind of in agreement on this latest uh, critical race and gender and queer theory. Um, but we disagree, uh, and we're happy to air those disagreements, honestly, and I, I wouldn't want to control your thoughts in any way whatsoever. The whole idea is horrifying to me. Um, so I, I, if the liberal instinct is still live and well here um, in my head, then I can't believe it's disappeared entirely from the country, even though it looked like it at times. We should probably take another question. Yes, please. Sully, I had something you said that kind of frustrated me when um, Rod brought it up. It was about atmosphere. And I think that the whole point of this was about coexistence and comfortability in atmosphere. And you said that an atmosphere should not dictate your behavior. Um, but the, the reality is that atmosphere does dictate behavior. Just like if we were to crank the heat up in here and we're all here together, some people actually might start to feel more comfortable where the majority of us may actually start to be very uncomfortable. And the, the frustration level uh, that I think is created here and just like the pastor said about trying to find a common ground forward and moving together so that everybody is comfortable. And when there's an objective, like if I object against your lifestyle because it's not what I want for myself, it's not meaning that I'm trying to make you uncomfortable, but this stigma that he was, that Rob was talking about is that people are actually afraid to say something. And, and it, it's sadly true, but to pretend that the atmosphere isn't gonna be the reason why that this atmosphere has been created, and, and sadly it's even affected you, as you, you said these far leftists have even suppressed you, and it's gotta make you uncomfortable, so now you're going into an atmosphere that you're actually trying to change the temperature of to try to make everybody comfortable, but you're not. And, and it's this back and forth, because I don't know if we're really looking for a, a common ground, and, and, and without radicalism being an issue, like you have priests here that are wearing their, um, their, their liturgical clothing and um, they stand out, but are they radical? Because they are making themselves known and that every time that they're somewhere, now that is a topic, that is a question, it's provoking something. But in reality, they're wearing it because they were the ones that were persecuted in the first place. So I, I would love to see some sort of explanation, someone, either one of you to hit a point here, which I feel like we kind of drifted far away from is, how is it that atmosphere is irrelevant when it is the most relevant thing, in my opinion? Well, let me address that. It is relevant. I, I didn't don't think I said it was irrelevant. It, it, in fact, for most people, it's dispositive. And, but the real difference is and that intimidates people from expressing their views, whereas they might otherwise. But I think the atmosphere has, has been hostile to religious faith now for a couple of centuries. Um, the difference now is that this atmosphere of discomfort for people of faith is being propagated by people with power um, who are dictating the terms of discourse and the terms of interaction in, in the spaces that they control. Look, I, unlike Rod, I work for a liberal magazine. And 
you know, every week is a struggle to say what I want to say as clearly as I want to say it. And, and the social media pressure, social media pressure on me to shut up or to agree is intense. I mean, really intense. Um, and, and it's also coming from within my own uh, group, who, who, my own colleagues, who many of whom think that simply associating with me is now uh, tantamount to complicity in evil. Um, who just don't, are not, it seems, particularly interested in working with people who disagree with them. In fact, that seems to be very hard for them. Um, so I'm very much painfully aware of what you're talking about. I'm as much a victim of it as, as anyone. In fact, those of us that are on the boundaries, you know, who are on the, the right, very right side of the left or the left side of the right, we're the ones that are most objected to this point <coughs> because we're the ones that have most power over on either side. Um, and look, if you look at the right, too, it's also been horribly policing its own ranks now for too long, which is why we've gotten to the state we have. Um, <clears throat> so I understand, but I'm still writing my columns, as I think, and I'm not being silenced, and I still live in a free society. And on a campus, you can still be openly Catholic or hold whatever view you want. And if you are shouted down, you should try and maintain strict liberal standards and insist that there be an equal opportunity to put forward your ideas. This new ideology prevents that uh, because it doesn't recognize the validity of open discourse, but it can be defended. It is being defended. I don't know why I'm the optimist here. I know whether I'm an optimist. I'm just a believer in not surrendering to the concept of real free thought and free religious faith in this atmosphere because a lot of it is purely intimidation. In some of its power, and uh, I think someone like me starting out in journalism today would not be allowed a career, to be honest. I don't think I'd be able to voice the ideas I have and be a mainstream media. I'm sort of grandfathered in now. Um, but I could be any minute, <laughs> any second, I could be gone. Well, I, I, I should say, Andrew, that I, I know that at the age of 53, I could not be hired or would not be hired at a mainstream media outlet, even though I've worked in newsrooms most of my, my career, just because of the positions I've taken that were perfectly normal, you know, only a few years ago. But um, I, and so I, I, to use the, the jargon, I think that you and I need to acknowledge our privilege because we have been grandfathered in. I work for a conservative magazine, um, but if I lost my job there, I don't, Quite know what I would do. I presume I'll be able to find something. I write books, but um, I, I think about young journalists, young people who are going into journalism today, who so, who are conservatives, and will ask me, well, "What do you think about it?" It's very hard for me to be encouraging to them uh, because I know how tough it was, even in the in the '90s and the 2000s, uh, which was when it was a much more open uh, sort of newsroom th than it is now. I mean, do you re you remember last summer the uh, when Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the New York Times, had a newsroom meeting uh, and somebody, the transcript leaked of it and somebody in the newsroom, some identified person, told him that they ought to put race in every story, even science stories. He did not defend this basic journalism there. He sort of ducked the question. You know, this is, there is this woke young generation of journalists that are turning journalism to something that it wasn't, that it shouldn't be. I'll get off that particular soapbox. I want to say, though, too. But, I, but you're right. Let me just say you're a thousand percent right. The atmosphere in these places has definitely soured in the last like four or five years in a way that's really remarkable. Um, and it is, I think, a function of a generation that has been brought up in this ideology suddenly entering mainstream journalism. Yeah. And also because journalism itself needs, is, is struggling. And so it needs young, cheap labor. And sure. so it has a disproportionate number of these young people who are disproportionately affecting the entire uh, framework of journalism. But I want also to say that this is a function partly of broader polarization within the society, um, which, is a, which is mutually enforced. Yeah. In other words, the right has a lot to answer for in all of this. The right's uh, intransigence in the past and its cult worship of this, uh, this monstrous fool that we have as president, um, and it's policing of its own ranks to purge it of dissent, uh, which has happened too, Rod. I mean, you've seen it happen. Uh, there are pressures on both sides. 
uh, the op but the opportunity with the First Amendment still in existence, however intimidated are, we are out of it, we can still hold it. And we can still prevail in it. And maybe this atmosphere will lift when well, people see that it's bullshit. A couple, couple quick things. Uh, last fall in Warsaw, I sat in the apartment of a woman named Maria, uh, uh, sorry, Zofia Romashevska, old lady, not very tall, uh, in her 80s. She's a real hero of Poland. The, the Polish government has recognized her. She and her husband were solidarity trade union activists who stood up against communist totalitarianism and really put their lives on the line over and over and over again. And uh, I was talking to her about wokeness in and, and the West today. What should we do? She was not having it. She said, you got to fight. You've got to get organized and you've got to fight. You can't sit there and let them intimidate you. Coming from a woman who literally risked her life to stand up to a real hard, ugly tyranny, that really, that really impressed me. And uh, it's something I'll be writing about that in, in my next book because she's seen what real tyranny is like. She is not intimidated by, by these woke commissars. And uh, I think that there's something, something we can learn from that. Uh, one more thing. What I'll I found particularly interesting in this particular battle is the way that private issues have been public. Like I, I had a private conversation with someone that was dragged out of context and put onto Twitter to discredit me as some sort of white supremacist. Or I had a private email I sent to a writer that was then outed on Twitter to ridicule me and to yeah. uh, this use of private interaction as a weapon against people, their public job, is a really disturbing phenomenon. And it, you know, I was watching the lives of others, which I know you love as a moving rod, but um, this sense that someone is watching you all the time, you're going to report you if you say or do something that's a little off against the ideology that you could be suddenly fired for being racist or sexist or bigot or homophobic or all the rest of it. This is creepy. It's deeply creepy and it's deeply illiberal. But I think the way to fight back is to practice liberalism, is to write your essays, write your articles, get out there as you're doing, Rod, and spreading the message. It is, and that in itself is enough. Because that in itself is a, is a refutation of their entire argument. You're still around. You can still make these issues and arguments, and people will still find them interesting and engage with them. I haven't lost my readership. It's just... Uh, it's, it's just been pared down. I well, think. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm just going to have to interrupt for a sec. We're having trouble with yeah. this, the main screen here, which is flickering on and off now in terms of our video link. Well, uh, it's also a, a little bit after 8.30, so we'll probably have to wind things up oh, soon. Well, I, we're going to go to a bar, and everybody can join <laughs> us. We're going to continue. Can we bring a laptop, and we can have you uh, maybe... Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to bed. <laughs> you can't come there. <laughs> <laughs> so exhausting. Um, but let's have another question. I mean, I don't want to, we've been hogging the limelight in a way. No, I, um, I, I, I appreciate the conversation. I, the th one thing that worries me, though, Andrew, is I keep hearing this over and over from people that they will not, from other conservatives, they will not talk about what's really on their mind unless they know that everybody around them already agrees. Not because they only want to hear their own opinions reflected back to them, but because the cost to them professionally and personally, if somebody takes what they say out of context and does what, what you've just described, will be too great. And uh, I, I've heard this for several years now, and I, I realize, you know what, I kind of do that myself. I'm out there on my blog saying what I really think, but um, I, I'm also really, really reticent to say anything in, mi in mixed company, meaning when I'm around people who I don't know, uh, I'm reticent to say something about it for fear of how it will be used against me. And this is something I think that's, that's totalitarian. It's not coming from the government, but I think it's a totalitarian mindset because it, it, it makes people afraid and it makes them suspicious of each other. Uh, now I've, we've lost you. Um, well, try, you try being an evangelical uh, wanting to criticize Trump in, your, in people's social circles. Um, in their communities and their families. It's the same thing is holding there um, in which we are afraid to say publicly what we believe privately. I mean, in this city, Washington, I mean, I've never been around where the public discourse is so entirely divorced from the private discourse. Uh, there are almost no Republicans who, who uh, 
who think Trump is a, a very stable genius, au contraire. And there are very few Democrats who really buy the whole woke stuff, in fact. Um, but then neither of those groups, which are majorities, prepared to challenge the reigning orthodoxies. Yeah. We actually have a person with one more question, if it's brief. Would that be okay with you all? Uh, okay, yeah. great. I'll try to be brief. Yeah, and it's not really a question, but I just wanted to clarify. I know Robbie George's name got mentioned, and I just want to bring out um, both him and Cornell West are good friends of mine, and they outlined a perfect program of seeking the truth and love and bringing people together with proper dialogue. So I just, if you've never watched the videos of Cornell West and Robbie George, please watch them. I know they were here at Bucknell, but I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression that he's for anything of not proper dialogue between the right and left. And I just wanted to bring that out. Well, you know, I... Uh... Yeah, I think that's true. But what's interesting, isn't it, is that they're both Christians. And... One of the things that I think that we're not recognizing with the collapse of Christianity in America is that Christianity performed a very important role for our politics and our discourse, which is that it was a bedrock assumption of freedom of conscience and the equality of human beings uh, on, in the eyes of God. Take that away and you see what happens to discourse when it's absent, when there isn't a unifying goal or a transcendent moment, when it's all imminent and it's all power. Uh, Christianity we need today because it's, it's, the, most, it's the strongest resistance to, to pure power. Uh, and uh, and it, it enables liberal democracy in a way that no other religion really quite does. And, you know, there's plenty of good arguments that John Locke and liberalism sprung out from uh, early uh, modern Christianity. And I think there's some, some truth to that. Uh, so the consequences of a country losing faith are not just spiritual, they're also political. You know, I, uh, I, a few years ago, I was asked by my uh, literary agent to go have a meeting with Wendell Pierce. Wendell Pierce is an African-American actor from New Orleans. He was in uh, The Wire. He played Bunk. He was in Treme. He's now in Jack Ryan. But the idea was that Wendell was looking for uh, a collaborator to help him work on a memoir about Katrina and how he was born and raised in New Orleans, went on to su professional success in Broadway and in Hollywood, but uh, Katrina made him realize how much his home in New Orleans meant to him, and it, it changed his life and his way of relating to his home. And uh, he wanted somebody to help him write this book. Well, he had read the book I wrote about my sister Ruthie, who died in 2011, and how watching her struggle with cancer gave me a different perspective on my own home back in Louisiana and caused me to move back. So Wendell and I got together to talk, and we were both so nervous. Here he is, liberal Democrat, African-American from the big city of New Orleans. Here I am, a white conservative from the hills of, of uh, north of Baton Rouge. But once we sort of like got around each other and just started talking about what we had in common, which was a love of our home state, which was a love of its traditions, a love of the church, and on and on and on. We talked for three hours. And that guy, this says so much about his character, he chose me to work with him and to help him write this book, even though I'm so different from him, because he realized that despite our very real and significant political differences, deep down what united us was a love for our state, a love for our people, and a love for our God. And I'll never... Uh, never stop loving him for trusting me with that story, with that sacred story of his family. But it's something that was really unlikely and wasn't supposed to happen. But happen it did. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. But I, and I've also, you know, how often does that get to happen when white people, black people, Latinos and so forth can come together and just talk without fearing, new, fearing recrimination or it can show vulnerability knowing that if they show vulnerability, that they're not going to be destroyed. Somebody's not going to take advantage of it and, and, and ruin them. I think that if we can get in some way, I don't know how we get back to a culture like that where people give each other the grace to be different. People give each other the grace to be wrong, and they love them anyway. That is something I've learned from Christianity, and it's something that 
I've, I've, it's been part of my ongoing repentance and trying to overcome that within myself, that quick, my quickness to anger. Uh, and rather, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to love. And it's something I'll be working on all my life. But thank God for, for my faith. Thank God for Jesus Christ. And thank God for the Orthodox Church holding me accountable. Anyway. Yeah, in the end, everything is redeemed by friendship, isn't it? Yeah, um, by, by love. No, by love. By, friendship endures. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll say just before we end, I want to uh, tell, tell a nice story about you, Andrew. When, I would, when my sister got diagnosed with cancer, she was younger than I, never smoked a day in her life, got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I flew down from Philadelphia to be at her bedside, and it was such a shock to our family. She had three little kids, and a husband. Um, I remember sitting on the plane flying back to Philadelphia, and I wrote to Andrew, we had been fighting. And I wrote to him and asked his forgiveness for the things I had said and for hurting him. And I told him that, you know, being confronted with my, what's happened to my sister it really clarifies things about life. And he said the same thing back to me, and our friendship got back on track. Um, that was a case where something really terrible, my, my sister's suffering, put things in perspective and caused me feel humble and to feel like I do not want to go through my life bearing grudges and giving other people reason to bear a grudge against me. And that doesn't say anything about my own holiness, but it just, I, I think what it does is it, it says something about humanity. And you did forgive me, and I forgave you, and we'll probably be forgiving each other for the rest of our lives because we're Christians, right? And I think that's normal. I really do. And I, and I'm, I, I, I hope that in my own Christian walk, uh, since I got broken so badly in my own intellectual arrogance, that I can try to model that, even though I get online and fight like the Dickens and say really mean things sometimes, um, I hope that I can always remember to repent at the end. Right, well, we with, with that note, maybe we should bring things to a close by thanking our two speakers tonight. And Andrew, thank you again for joining us with, you know. I, I want to apologize again. Um, I, if my doctor had told me I could go, I would have gone. But I, I, this is as much as I could do right now. Um, and I've had a lovely time. But I, I, I ask you to forgive me for not being able to get there physically. Oh, well, thank, thank you for joining us with, with all that you have going on there. And, um, and I'd love to have seen you, Rod, too. It would be nice to just catch up. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be in Washington soon. Uh, probably I'll find her. Okay, reason. good. Then let's do that. I'll I'll find her. As long as you're out of the hospital, but <laughs> yeah, take care of yourself. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks again to both of you, and let's maybe we'll thank them one more time. Bye.